Hi, everybody. We're going to get started. Um, so I'll introduce myself. My name is Ailed. I am the president of NOMAS. Hello, everyone. My name is Sterling Fitzgerald, and I am the vice president of NOMAS. So welcome to our second lecture of the NOMAS uh, Black History Month series. Before we continue, NOMAS acknowledges with respect the Onondaga Nation, fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people of whose ancestral lands Syracuse University stands on. Our presenter today, Matthew Trotter, is a talented designer, architect, and team leader who has worked on many projects that range from hotel and theme entertainment to offices and multifamily housing projects. He is an associate at Cunningham, based in California. He has served various leadership positions in SoCal NOMA, which is the Southern California National Organization of Minority Architecture Architects, and uniquely the Summer Camp Committee, helping young individuals in their early journey through architecture through digital design. Uh, furthermore, he has been nominated as the president of SoCal NOMA for the upcoming year of 2025. This lecture named One in 300, Creating Opportunity and Access in Adverse Conditions, will follow Matthew's journey from initial exposure to licensure and how he navigated through barriers such as bias, racism, and financial hardship, to obtaining a title leadership with a repu re reputable, sorry, reputable t uh, firm and recognition in the field of architecture. Please help us in welcoming Matthew Trotter. Um, it's very nice to be here today. Thank you so much to the Dean. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Sterling. Thank you, Ailed. Um, thank you, Nathan. Thank you to all of the advisors that I've met and all the wonderful students. Um, I, you, I saw some of your projects up there and I, I don't know if it's predominant. How, how many second years are here today? Raise your hand. Third? Okay, so it's first? Okay, so it's mostly second year and fourth and above. Um, some of the work that you guys are doing is work that I was doing in, in third year in, in, in college. Um, so really impressive work. Um, I also want to point out that I do have my Syracuse socks on. I'm from USC, but you know, when, when you're in Rome, do as the Romans. So I really appreciate you guys having me here today. Um, also, you know, thinking about creating opportunity and access in adverse conditions. I, I hope that by the end of this lecture, you are all inspired and also um, interested in giving back as well. And so it's funny, you know, I mentored Sterling. He was a part of the NOMA Fellowship at our firm at Cunningham. And here comes that full circle where Sterling has invited me to come to his school and t talk to you all. I think that's really powerful and it really tells you all how to nurture those relationships and, and nurture the bonds that you create in architecture and all the people that you meet. It's very, very important. Uh, my name is Matthew Trotter. I'm a licensed architect in the state of California. Uh, as they said, my presentation is 1 in 300, Creating Opportunity and Access in Adverse Conditions. Um, you all know the, the architectural industry is difficult in general, but even more challenging for minorities. Out of 35 million people in California, there's 21,000 licensed architects, and only 300 are African American. I'm one of them. Um, though arduous, due to prejudice and systemic racism on top of the general difficulty in architecture, I've had a beautiful, exciting journey from where I started to where I am today, and I'm proud of that journey, and I'm here to share my story with you all and hope that it will serve to encourage and uplift while providing some tangible ways to take action to change the world around you. Every one of these slides or these sections are going to be about how to create opportunity and how to, how to navigate adverse conditions. And none of that can be possible without beginnings and having an inspiration. And so <clears throat> I was born in West Los Angeles and raised in Inglewood, California. I don't know if you, you, you guys have all been to Inglewood, California, or you've only seen the movies. <laughs> it was a little bit of a tough place to, to grow up in, um, but it, it, it probably wasn't as bad as you saw in, in the movies. I was the last in a family five, so I'm the baby. And though we may, have, may not have had much money, we had an abundance of love for our family, our community, and people in general. 
my father was an incredible cabinet maker and he was working in a a uh, doctor's um, house, um, and he was doing some, some mill work for him. And that doctor, that doctor knew that my father was interested in architecture, and so he showed my father this really beautiful round arch, and he said, hey, do you know who, who did this house? And he said, Paul R. Williams. Does everybody know who Paul R. Williams is? Kind of, yeah, that's good. Um, so Paul R. Williams, he was a famous African-American architect in Los Angeles. He also went to USC. And um, he ended up giving my father a signed book by his granddaughter. And he gave that in turn to me. And uh, I was excited. I think I was around seven. And I was completely amazed by his work, but troubled by the issues his color of skin caused him in his career. So he's my inspiration. But as I'm reading this, Williams had teachers trying to discourage him from being an architect with statements like, your own people can't afford you, and white clients won't hire you. He had to learn how to draw upside down. I don't know if you guys all know this. So he would, he would sit with white clients on the other side of the table and draw upside down. That's impressive. Um, so that they didn't have to sit next to him. Um, he had to work twice as hard to achieve positions and promotions. And he even obtained a structural engineering license on top of his architectural certificate. And I told my dad that, yo, this is, uh, this is nice and all, but I, I can't do this. Like, I'm not going to be able to do what he did. And not only am I afraid that I'm not going to make it, I'm, I don't even want to go through that level of prejudice and racism. I don't want to deal with those problems. I'll just do something else. And my dad sat me down and he said, you can do it. You can be better than him. And from that day forward... I said, all right, I'm going to be an architect at, at seven years old. And that's my lovely parents. That's my mom and my dad at my, my uh, dinner that we had for my, my, me gaining my license. And then that's a little special moment with me and my father shedding some tears because we were hearkening back to that story, right? Remembering back when he told me I can do it. And then I really did it. That was pretty, pretty exciting. Um, The next thing that's important is determination and perseverance on your journey. Um, in my last year at CAMS, CAMS is the California Academy of Mathematics and Science. It's a very highly sought after um, school to be in for high school. I thought I was the stuff. I was like, oh, I'm going to get into USC. That's where I want to go. That's where Paul R. Williams went. I'm easily going to get in. So all I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply to USC. And then I'm going to apply to like two other schools. I said, eh, San Luis Obispo and uh, Cal Poly. And I didn't get in. I don't know if any of you guys have gotten a little, little statement like this. You get a little letter in the mail. And you're like, oh, wait, what's going to happen? <laughs> and it starts with, it is with regret. So I got one of those from, from USC. And um, I didn't plan any backups. And I also didn't get into San Luis Obispo. And I also didn't get into Cal Poly Pomona. So... <laughs> I was kind of in a precarious situation, and um, my mom only gave me the day to sulk when she pushed me to move forward and meet with the school counselor to assess my options. We quickly got an application ready for Cal State LA, which is an excellent school, um, and I chose the engineering program since they had no architecture school. And I was surprised that I was accepted on such short notice with a full ride. I dedicated myself to that year and achieved a 4.0 GPA. And so what's important about this moment of, this, of my story is there's going to be plenty of times in life where you're going to get a no. Um, someone's gonna, there's going to be a barrier. But if you've got a clear sight and clear vision on what you want to do, keep pushing forward with that. So, and also enjoy the detours. I've had a, quite a bit of different detours in my uh, my career and those detours actually you'll see later into my career actually helping me get to where I want to go. So um, I also took many art classes as, as, a, as many as I could to update my architectural portfolio knowing that I would reapply to USC at the end of the semester and I always knew the USC School of Architecture was the place for me so being denied the first time was just an opportunity for me to hone my skills and become a better me. I got in and was proud to be one of the 150 students that are accepted to the school. 
each year, and I was so excited that I ran to my engineering professor, and I said, hey, I got into USC. And he's like, oh, that's great. Like, what's, what are you doing? I said, the School of Architecture. And he said, huh, what a waste of height. That's what he told me. Like, that was the first thing. There's a, there's a I, I forgot who it is. There's, a, there's a, uh, a comedian that said, have you ever heard something so racist you didn't know, you didn't understand it? So I was like, what? I said, no, 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 maybe, maybe, he mis maybe he misheard me. So I'm like, no, it's a school of architecture, one of the hardest architecture schools to get into. Um, and he goes, yeah, but, like, have you ever thought about the basketball team? So I, and, I, I, and I was thinking to myself, I mean, like, geez, he said what a waste of height. I mean, what a waste of a, a brain. Like, if I, can, if, I can, if I can do something special like this, why detract me from, from doing it? But... These are some of the statements that I heard growing up, all the way up to the collegiate level. And then I got into USC, so then I had to persevere. I got into USC, and, and I was about to have another rude awakening. This is, this is our, uh, our architecture building. Sterling, do you see what I'm, I was talking about? The waffle slaps? Anyways, <laughs> you guys have a beautiful campus, so we were walking around, and I was telling Sterling a little bit about the architecture on USC's campus. After all my years in after school programs, extracurricular art classes, magnet school, and AP courses, I found that I was completely behind in my architectural knowledge. Most of my awareness came from Paula Williams and, and that book, and, and there were some beautiful buildings in there, but I also was taken from my home neighborhood, which was mostly like liquor store and Target and, you know, just kind of typical fast food and commercial buildings. I had never heard of Le Corbusier or Alvar Aalto, nor did I understand what postmodernism or brutalism architecture was. The buildings that were shown to me were alien and foreign to my understanding. They were beautiful and interesting, but they scared me because they, they seemed, it seemed like everyone else was aware of them except for me. I felt inadequate, and I was one of only three black students in a group of about 150, and I came from no money. The other students seemed well prepared with fathers and mothers who were architects. They knew the material. They always had access to the expensive supplies required to build models I could not acquire. And worst of all, it was difficult getting close and befriending others as the class quickly became cliquish. So I immediately realized that I was an outsider and nonetheless, I persevered through long nights of studio, which you all have been telling me about in this, this project that you guys have done, <laughs> really great projects. Sometimes not sleeping at all. You get some hand raises in here? No? Okay. <laughs> um, and I had countless other difficulties, but we don't have time to go through each, each detail. And next we talk about agility, and this is where it's important to understand the detours. Upon graduating in 2010 after the recession, work in architecture was extremely competitive due to poor construction market, and I probably applied to every small firm in Los Angeles, every large firm, and I was having such a difficult time, I eventually went to help agents sell gold. Like, I, I was a USC School of Architecture graduate, and I was in there just trying to help pay the bills, you know? I, was a, I wasn't even the person on the phone selling the gold. I was somebody who was running tickets for the people selling the gold, and they treated me very poorly. Um, and while I was working this job, I had a friend said, hey, Matt, you know, he graduated from uh, School of Architecture with me. And he said, I, you know, I'm doing, some, I'm doing some theme park work. You should come over here and do it. And I was like, I do modern contemporary architecture. What are you talking about? I don't do any of that. I don't do that stuff. I'm going to keep helping people sell gold over here <laughs> because of my pride, foolish pride. I'm going to keep doing this over here and not continue to hone my skills in architecture or keep drawing or use Revit or use AutoCAD. I'm not gonna do any of that, and I'm gonna stay at this job. That didn't, that didn't stay for long. Um, I started to realize how terrible of a mindset that was, and architecture is, is very expansive. It's landscape, it's the, it's the complete built environment, it's the, it's, the, it's the enclosures of the artwork, it's the experiences that we we as humans get to be a part of, right? And that includes having fun and being playful. And so I, I went to that job and I started to work with him in theme parks and, and 
I couldn't believe how exciting the work was. Um, and I, this is, I, love, I grew up on Batman. This is, uh, I was the, the lead designer and, and architect for, uh, this is Warner Brothers in um, Abu Dhabi. And so this is the Batman ride, which was really cool. I was kind of head over all of the attractions. Um, but um, I became a manager fairly quickly in the theme park world, but I wasn't getting my hours for my license, and I was making really good money. They pay very well. It's like the entertainment industry. It's like film industry. It's like, all right, what do you need? All right, here. So going from that and going, okay, you guys can see how loose I am. Like, I'm an architect. I have them on my black, but, you know, I'm not trying to be oppressive. So I go, okay, I need to get my hours, so I need to pivot. And so in trying to pivot, I started to go to all the, the great firms, and everyone was telling me, like, Matthew, we'd love to have you but, you know, we're going to have to cut your salary by, like, 50%. It's like, so that's a massive cut. And I live in Los Angeles. What's really awesome about my detour, Cunningham actually were, they were the architect of record on several theme parks, right? And um, they saw my portfolio, and they saw what made me not as valuable to other firms made me extremely valuable to Cunningham, right? And so this whole detour where I was like, well, am I ever going to get my hours? Am I ever going to become an architect? It actually turned out that detour became my entry into the field. I love Jurassic Park. I grew up on Jurassic Park. <laughs> this is another one of my, my, my projects, and I did the, the, uh, the glass dome in the, in the background beyond the, beyond the trees. And it, so they were looking for architectural designers that had experience in entertainment um, as they were working for Universal in Beijing. And um, this is just a couple other pieces of my work. Um, if you've ever been to Marvel Land, this is uh, Disneyland uh, in California. And then also um, I start to pivot in, because Cunningham is split up into different studios with all of the human experience which includes play, where people play, right? Theme parks, hospitality, restaurants, distilleries, um, and live, like where people live, right? So that's multifamily. Uh, uh, office is under our work studio, and heal is our healthcare, right? You kind of see where this is going. Um, and so I start to pivot from theme park design to hospitality. So this is a hotel in downtown LA that I worked on. And now to talking about kind of finalizing the discussion on access and opportunity. I wouldn't have gotten anywhere without having faith in, in a growth mindset. And so reflecting on my experience, I realized I couldn't explain how I transform adversity into opportunity without talking about faith. And though I'm spiritual myself, when I say the word faith, I'm not referencing any religious definition of the term. I found early in my journey that the idea of faith was a universal concept, similar to a growth mindset that I could use to traverse the difficult road ahead of me. The concept is this. Faith and hope are two different things. Hope is the desire for a specific outcome, and faith is the complete confidence and determination that comes from the result, from believing in something, the, and plus the actions and behavior that goes along with believing whatever it is that you believe. This caused me to see that equity could be thought of as two sides of the same coin. On one side of that coin, we need to demand for problematic systems to change, whatever it is. Many architecture students are demanding a revamp of the typical architecture curriculum as it often neglects significant contributions from, other, from cultures other than European. So activating community support and pushing for positive change is critical. But on the other side of that coin is a mindset that is required to achieve your goals. A mindset that says that even if those systems were to never change, even if people attack me or verbally abuse me or deny me admission or wrongfully detain me, I will overcome. There is nothing that will keep me from reaching my dreams. This is the type of tenacity minority leaders use to reach their mountaintop. 
whether they were fighting for justice, whether, whether their, their fight for justice was in regards to race, gender, sexual preference, or accessibility, they exhibited perseverance. I believed I could become an architect, and so throughout my life, I acted accordingly to that, based on my belief to reach my goals no matter what obstacle, obstacles came in my way. So we need to demand for issues within our systems to change, but at the same time, we need to be achieving our own greatness, no matter the barriers we see in front of us, for the sake of those that come after. So giving back by looking forward and creating opportunity for others. So now that you've created opportunity for yourself, how do you create access for others? I, I love this image. At the, this is at the SoCal Noma summer camp, and one of the students wrote me this, this, this letter, and I cried when I read it. It's just so sweet. I, I won't read it here, but you guys can see it on the screen. I mean, even the, look at the way they write. I give thanks for spending time to show me architecture. So cute. <laughs> so speaking of those that come after or giving back, I joined NOMA around 2012, which is the National Organization of Minority Architects. And I joined to connect with others like me, to be mentee as well as for me to become a mentor. I was heavily involved in the architectural and engineering summer camp as a mentor and a program creator for eight years. The camp was often referred to as Project Pipeline, but unfortunately, after college, many designers of color would never actually enter the field, let alone successfully become licensed architects. A true pipeline leads the medium from one source to another. In this case, we had a gap in the pipeline. This was also around the same time that I had passed three exams and was seen from many in the organization as the next SoCal Noma architect to look out for. And this was an awkward position to be in at times as I had mentors who were older than me and more knowledgeable but had never gained their license. One of those mentors congratulated me at a meeting one day and said, wow, you're the one, Matthew, you're the one. And I had heard that phrase before Back in middle school, before I was accepted into CAMS, there were words from other young black and brown students that were already defeated mentally due to the lack of access to resources, which is so prevalent in underrepresented communities. I remember they would say things like, ah, math isn't for me. Ah, eh, reading isn't, that's not for me. That's, that's for people like Matthew. Like, this isn't for me. This is for people like Matthew. He's the one. And it was after this that I coined the phrase, I'm the one, but so are you. I'm the one, but so are you. And it's referencing the fact that though I was able to achieve my goals via faith and all the qualities I described before, there were still things that I had access to that others didn't. That would make their journey even more difficult. It's a blessing that I got into a firm like Cunningham that provides support to many of the major issues identified by black designers regarding licensure. The National Council of Architects Board Survey finds that a lack of access to mentorship, study materials, resources, and financial aid were at the top. I had access to these things, so I begged to ask the question, what could others do if they had the support I had? What could that mentor that said I was the one achieve if he had this access. So I became the founder of the first developing professional group at SoCal Noma, which aims to provide mentorship, exam seminars, study materials, and financial aid. I saw the gap in the pipeline and I was dedicated to filling it all while continuing my own journey to become licensed. And I did do that. I became licensed along with seven other individuals who, who also became, I took them on the journey with me, right? You can do that. You don't have to do, you know, you don't have to overload yourself, but just be thinking about what are the ways I can give back? What are the ways that I can open the doors for others who are like me? It's really important. And my efforts received several recognitions, including a seat on the executive board of SoCal Noma for four years. And I'm proud to say at the end of that fourth year, those seven other members who went through the development professional program had finished had all finished either all of their national exams and their California supplemental, or they had finished all of their exams for their national. I also formed the first employee resource group at my firm, Nomad Cunningham, to connect Noma members across offices to create a safe space for racial minority designers and architects. 
So it's all about pushing the needle. It's all about doing as much as you can. Um, no one's, I don't think it's, it's in anyone's interest for you to overload yourself, but do what you can. And, and what you can is different for everybody. Your journey is, is different. So at this point, I'm going to, I'm actually going to, I, I don't want to end any lecture. I kind of talked about my, my life story and, and being in ad adverse conditions. This is also a story of um, also kind of pivoting. And I also want you guys to take this away as you move into your careers, having the ability to pivot and advocate for yourself. And um, so at this point in time, I'm going to show some, some projects that are under NDA that I'm working on and the designs that I'm working on. So I'm going to have to ask for the, any cameras or any pictures to, to not film this portion. Um, but I appreciate you all for being here today. And I'll end. Am I on time or over? Perfect. That's what I like to hear. Perfect. And I also have a workshop tomorrow that's, that's pretty cool. And that's, that's kind of a question on architect as developer. And I just uh, finished a, a real estate program at USC that was pretty amazing. Do you want to switch that out? Um, and uh, I'm pretty late in my career. I'm 37. And um, growing up in Inglewood, I, I don't understand how to generate wealth. I didn't understand, you know, how, how real estate works. And... It's a very, very impactful program, and I think that all architecture students should be aware of the development process. Uh, there's a lot of different things that you can do with this knowledge. We're going to touch on the real, like, high-end con conceptual stuff. But um, the amount of confidence it gives you to stand in front of your clients and understand what they're talking about, understand their drivers. We know what our drivers are. We know what we want to do good. We are charged by the state. I'm charged by the state of California to do good. <laughs> That's what it says in my license. Do good. So we always, we bring this kind of different thing that they're charged with. They're charged by capitalism to like maximize the profit. That's a totally different, right? And they, they seem, they, they're seemingly at odds when we work with our clients. But there's a way to synthesize that and create synergy. And there's also a way for us to be our own clients as well. So um, tomorrow's lecture, oh, lecture it's kind of like a more interactive conversation right um, we're going to be working through highest and best use um, problems together we're going to be learning about net operating income we're going to be understanding about cap rates a little bit um, and how they relate to the asset value and then we're going to do a little design charrette where we've got a, a site and we've got and also you all all are going to have a pro forma I'm going to give you guys an excel pro forma that actually works it's real so everybody who, who joins, you can go out into your real life and you could look at a site and type in the, the amount of beds. You can type in the amount of square feet, the amount of costs, look at your construction, and you can punch out a number and you can punch out an internal, internal rate of return, IRR is what developers look at. Um, usually, typically, if it's over 10%, it's a good thing. I won't start diving, but I'm trying to give you guys a little bit understanding of like what we'll be touching on. Um, I think it'll be a lot of fun. So hopefully you guys, you guys come through. And please, pour on the questions. If you guys don't want to ask me questions, like in front of the entire, we can talk off, or I'll come to the school tomorrow, and I could do some desk crits or something. Yes? So you mentioned feeling like behind mm -hmm. in terms of like architectural, like how to knowledge. So you mentioned feeling behind in terms of architectural vocabulary and history knowledge. Um, can you talk about the feeling of like, inadequacy and uh, like you're kind of not supposed to be there or feeling like you're in the wrong place? I still have that to sometimes today. Like it's uh, a, <clears throat> one of my principals said, Matthew, you look, you, you seem a little different and I'm a fairly confident person. Um, but the, you know, I was telling them that what you're not, what you're seeing in me is not an increase in confidence. It's a lowering of the Matthew naysayer that's inside of me that says like, oh, should we really be here or not? Um, when I was growing up in Inglewood, I had this idea that making money wasn't for me. It was for other people, right? Like, that's not for me, that's for... It wasn't even a negative projection onto the other people. It was just was like, it's just not for me. Like, 
going to like the like going to the mountains and, and skiing down a mountain. Like that's not for me. That's for other people, right? And the same thing happens in architecture. Like okay, okay maybe designing is not for me. It's for other people. Or when I was at architecture school, I'm going. Maybe this, maybe this really isn't for me. I'm really, I don't know what they're talking about. And even the kind of the, the way that like sometimes people would like interact with each other. Like I remember one time, it always stand out to me is I felt really inadequate at, at this moment. It's like not only was I having a tough time in architecture, I was trying to like create bonds and create, you know, community. And there was a group of guys that, that were cool with me and and then they just turn and they like put their heads off the desk and go hey hey man like you want to let's go to let's go to Vegas they're like Matt you want to go to Vegas I go oh sure that, that'd be great I'll go with you guys all right so I said when are you guys going they're like I don't know T tomorrow I was like uh what like how do you guys have the money to do that like you don't you need to plan and they're like no nah, you don't have it and so that question was like oh yeah, I don't have it. And, and should I even be here at SC with all these people that seem to have it? Not only do they have it in terms of money, but they have it in terms of the skills, the design. So there was a lot of feelings of, like, should I be here or in inadequacy. Um, but I think what's important is to have all the things that I talked about in the, the kind of the major slides, to have an inspiration, right? Whenever you feel down, you get to kind of look back and lean on that. And then also, like, having your people. And, you know, my people were my mom and dad, but it may be your aunt and uncle. It may be someone that you know, a mentor that's, like, kind of, like, the reason why I kind of got, I pivoted to design is because of Drake Dillard, who's a past NOMA president, also past national president. He's a mentor of mine in L.A., and he was looking at my sketch and said, Matthew, why are you not designing? Why, have, why, haven't it, why aren't you a designer at, at Cunningham? And I was like, oh, because I'm a project architect. He's like, what are you talking about? Like, no, you're supposed to be a designer. So sometimes you don't always get yourself out the rut, which is why it's really important for you to be that for somebody else. Because I wouldn't have... I didn't make it all the way here to Syracuse and, and status and title leader in my firm and all that stuff. I didn't get here because I just wheeled it all the way through. There were people who picked me up, and so you can be that same person to other people. Was that, okay. <laughs> Did I answer the question? Anyone else? I see you back there. <laughs> You're thinking about it. It could be design, anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so like what happens when you can't depend on this random saving hand that scoops you up and pushes you in the right direction? Um, Self-reflection. Knowledge of self is key. If you understand yourself, you'll, you'll, go, you'll get far. And so a lot, of, you know, a lot of times we don't take the time to self-reflect. You can meditate. You can do all types of different things. Ask yourself questions and write down the answers. And if you can understand why you're angry or why you're upset or why you're sad, if you can even identify those emotions and then understand like, why am I upset today? Okay, it's because of those things, th those guys that said this thing and it made me feel this way. Is that true? Now you get to, you get to write it down and then you get to compare it to your inspiration, you get to compare it to your agility. You get to compare it to your perseverance and determination. You get to compare it to your growth mindset. You get to compare it to your faith. Well, okay, I feel inadequate. Maybe I'm not supposed to be an architect. But my goal is to be an architect, and I believe in it full, wholeheartedly. So what I'm experiencing right now is just a momentary 
right? It's just a momentary dip in the ride of your life. And if you can have that type of perspective and jump out of the moments of your life to see the, the scale, you'll, you'll be able to reflect and realize where I am today is a dip from yesterday, but it's a massive difference from where I was at three years ago. And then chart the graph. Chart the graph and be like, oh, got it. My bad. Because your life does this. Like as you continue to progress, it's, the projection is trending forward, upward, but there's going to be dips. That happens in the stock market. No one pulls their money out. People don't make their money because they pull the money out when it gets low. They pull it out when it's, when it's appropriate, and sometimes it's low, sometimes it's high, and they wait until it's the right time, right? You have to use that on yourself as well in terms of your experiences and where you've been. Is that... I was curious about your experience with theme parks. I was just wondering to this day if there's things that you take from that process, specifically in design, that you integrate in your process to this day that you wouldn't have necessarily have known to do without that experience. That's an excellent question. And storytelling. Storytelling. When I first got into theme park design, a normal architecture firm, I mean, you have, like I said, you have your project architecture, project designer, project managers. You go into a theme park design firm, boutique design firm. There is a writer, there's a show producer, there's a tech team, there's a, like making pyrotechnic stuff. Like, oh, this is going to be the, the, the fog that shoots out. And you're like, whoa, what, what is, so there's people making games in the background. There are narrators, there's, it's just everything that you see, the long list that's on the, in the movies, the people who work on those projects, that's kind of like who were there. They kind of model that same idea. And so I, the whole thing is based on the story that they're creating. And so the architectural side or the show set side is what, what we call it. They don't get to start designing or get tapping in until the writer's done. The writer's done, they've got a script. Then we get to read the script, then it goes to the art director. And the art director gets kind of some They'll draw, they'll draw this room, say it's, you know, this is a, it's a story about a young girl and she becomes brave enough to move through this volcano and as she rises to the top, she reaches her goal and she defeats the, the you know, her fears, which is the fear dragon. We get that story, then the art director starts to draw it in like watercolor. They're not drawing plans of it, it's just a perspective. It's super loose and it's super artistic. It's really beautiful stuff. It's stuff like, it's like comes out of like a, a Disney catalog of like art. And then we get that and then we have to translate that through the structure and through the building and then the architect does, then we architect, right? Um, it's not something that I don't believe that architects can't do, right? But we, temp we tend to not necessarily operate or work like that. Um, I think also the schedules of projects, the constraints tend to get us to, okay, do the feasibility study, come up with like, like do the do material study, there's some context, and then like in the real world, we're trying to like punch that out fairly quickly, and uh, I bring that to projects. I'm always talking about story, and it's always not necessarily this like thematic story, right? You know, we talked about the story of the journey of faith. You don't always know where you're going. How does that translate in an architectural party? That's where that comes from, and I got that from my theme park experience. So it was very, very helpful, and it also, I mean, I could argue that it, it helped me become a, you know, designer at my firm. Um, I guess something related to um, producing your own story. I was actually talking to Bella about this earlier today. Um, in school, a lot of times we have our professor and then we have ourselves and um, we come up with all these concepts and ideas that we then bring to the professor and they critique. But um, what I was talking to Bella about is that sometimes people find that they have to do exactly what their professor says to do. Um, so I guess my question is 
how would you, or what advice would you give to um, people now at this point of time where you have like your own concepts and ideas, but you also have the student professor um, in which is there to enlighten you and um, help your designs become more coherent. Um, how would you say to balance that? It's tough because there's a constant question of whether like maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because the levels, there's a lot of levels between your professors and people who've done actual art, architectural work. So they're bringing that, they're not only bringing that experience, but they're also bringing their biases. Not necessarily a negative thing, biases good and bad, right? Like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of, I lean, I tend to lean to more rectilinear buildings. You got this big whoopy whoppy. Coin it. Got a big whoopy whoppy. It's a big curvilinear building. You're like, yo, that's not what I'm used to. So I don't, they, they may not even realize, right, within themselves. That's why emotional intelligence is really important in architecture, to be able to understand where someone's coming from. They may not even realize that there may be even a fear of, like, how do I coach somebody in a project that I don't know how to do myself, right? So that's why it's difficult, and I, I understand that. Um, I encourage you all to be advocates for yourself. There's going to be a lot of people say you can't do something, and that doesn't make them a bad person, and it doesn't make them wrong. It just, they're just not right about you, right, and what you're doing. So um, I would say test it test it like we sometimes can feel so strongly about something that we don't want to budge and you have to ask yourself similar to, what was your name david. david nice to meet you david matthew nice to meet you from so far away um kind of what david was talking about it's like that self-reflection right and if you can self-reflect and say why am i not nudging on this am i not nudging on this because i really like it or I'm not nudging on it because I actually did the due diligence to test it. You'll find out if it's bad. You can find that out, right, if you test it. And also, open those conversations up with your advisor and say, look, I don't know everything. And I don't want you to get the vibe that I don't want to move forward or be redirected because I just don't. Can we just have a session on, like, testing the hypothesis? Let's just do, let's just have a full on, like, can I get your after hours and get 30 minutes of your time, and let's just throw things at the wall and fight against my idea, right? And let's go for the pros and let's go for the cons, right? And so does this concept speak to the context of the community? Does this, is this, is this concept physically feasible, right? Does this concept meet the programmatic elements that were required? If you can say yes to all those things and the, and the advisor is still like, I don't like it, well, now we know you don't like it. That's all we found out. You don't like my project, but I do. And it, met, it, it hits all the criteria. So you can't, they're not there to tell you what to do. They're there to help you, right? And I don't think anybody is, hopefully no one, none of your advisors are, are there to tell you what to do, and I don't get that vibe from the school, right? And I think it could be a matter of how you, how you pose a question changes drastically how someone answers it. I was talking to, it, it, sometimes I want to say Eilid, it's Eilid, Eilid. I was talking to Eilid yet, uh, today about her project, and she, she's like, she's kind of, well, so, you know, I think it's, so it's kind of like this because, and I go, well, when you say it like that, it makes me, f it's like shark in water and you see blood. It gives me the idea that you may not be sure about your moves and why you did them. We're, we're, that's our, Nathan, that's what they pay you to do, to grill. The, oh, I see a, a soft spot. Let me poke right there. See if you know what you're talking about. And when I poked, I knew exactly why she was doing it, right? She answered it. 10 minutes into the conversation, I said, lead with that. You have to lead with the sure, I know where I'm going. 
the project, this is a project, it's this and this program, the story's because of this, and the moves why, that you're seeing are because of X, Y, and Z. That's a totally different conversation than going, so I was thinking I was going to do this. Because th that, that gesture is basically inviting, like, I don't really know, right? But she did know. She has a really great project. She does know. That would change the way that I critique it. So that's what I would sh share with you is like be, be confident and test your ideas to the point where you have a confidence in it, not just because you said you like it or the advisor said they liked it, right? There's ways to test theory. mentors they were old school and so they would just they really shared with me that they didn't have time but one thing that I did is uh, I would tell them that they're my mentor they didn't have like a choice <laughs> so uh, you know here's what's funny like the chances that someone's gonna turn you yeah someone's gonna turn you down one but the chances someone's gonna turn you down with like that level of like I really love your work I really like what you do I want you to be my mentor. What are they gonna say? No. No, I do not want to mentor you. Well, what's gonna happen is they're gonna go, they're gonna try to figure out a way. They're gonna say, well, I'm pretty busy and I'm, I head up this organization. I do this in my firm. You go, okay, no problem. Give them the, the plan. Same thing with how I got to where I'm at at Cunningham. I gave them the plan. I didn't come up to them and say, hey, I think I wanna be a designer. I say, I want to be a designer, and here's my strategic plan on how it will work from a project management standpoint and from a financial standpoint. If you give them facts, you can test the theory, right? And so, like, here's my theory. I think I can be a designer. I already tested it. You know more than me. Does it not make sense? And they looked at it and said, this kind of makes sense. And now, I'm one of the very few people at my firm that I work across all studios. I work... I've done interiors, I've done architecture, I've done design work. Um, I do a little bit of everything, and that didn't come from just hoping and wishing and something just fall into my lap. It's something that you have to carve out for yourself because no one's gonna do it for you. So mentors are the same thing. You know, I didn't come up to Sterling. You know, I think, Sterling, you were talking to coffee and. Sterling's like, I want to I wanna meet with you. And so he kind of told me what he wanted to do. So I'm like, oh, okay, great, cool. I can make time for this. I'm very busy, but I'll make time for it. And so, um, so do that for your mentors. Like, give them a, t like, hey, I think I would love to meet with you once a month. It can be on, now we can do it on Zoom. I can do like, can we do 30 minutes, like once every month? There should be a moment of 30 minutes in a month, an architect's month that they can find to talk to you about something, right? And if you do that on very, so then what I did is I split all my mentors up in very specific things, technical design, artistic design, um, like so basically code and, and then dealing with this person with like color, materiality, and then what you end up doing is you separate the time that each mentor would have to spend by teaching you all of it. You split it up into people, right? If you want to do some interiors, go find an interior designer and like have those conversations, right? And if you just want to pick me up, somebody who's motivating, they're not even really talking about architecture. They're te teaching you how to do emotional intelligence and how to be a leader at your firm. Separate that person if you can. So you make it easier on yourself and uh, on others because it's easy for you to kind of talk to one person about a very specific thing and then you can condense the time a bit. That's what I, I ended up doing. It worked for me. I don't know if it'll work for you, but if you can find a mentor that's gonna help you with all those things, that's great.
Oh, I thought, I th- you know what I thought you were doing? I thought she was like, oh, I'm going to get her. So I thought she was walking up to the front to ask me the question. I said, I respect it. Bring it. But no question? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>